I am grateful and I'm honored to be here with you. I was very much looking forward to our discussion and conversations today. I've been with the UN for about uh, one year and three months. I was appointed uh, last, uh, last July and uh, prior to that I was with the City of New York uh, for some time as the Acting General Manager of New York City Housing Authority and prior to that as, as the CIO. Um, what I'd like to talk about is about uh, prevention of crisis because we spend a lot of time talking about how do we react to crisis. But how do we get together, both as a government entity, UN, NGOs, and the private sector, and think about these big issues and think about prevention? So let's see if we can get a slide up there. Um, the, um, every morning when I wake up, I wake up to what we call the UN Operations Crisis Center Report. And I've been looking at that report every morning for the last 14 months. And I just want to share with you some of those crises. I'm sure you know about it. You know about the Ebola crisis, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, and moving further out in West Africa. Human rights violations, human trafficking, 1.2 million child victims, second largest criminal enterprise 80% are women, 50% are minors. Drug trafficking, food crisis, 805 million people do not have enough food to eat. Look at what's happening in Mali or South Sudan with famine. Water crisis, the third largest global concern. Our failure to mitigate the climate change the serious incidents with extreme impacts, such as the typhoon in Philippines. The severe income disparity, where 1% of the people on this earth have access to 40% of the wealth. The youth unemployment in most developing markets, over 50%. The fiscal crisis in so many of our emerging markets, the profound political and social instability, most of it in Africa, Congo, Mali, South Sudan, Syria, there are 2.5 million refugees and another 6.5 million people living in Syria right now. Desperate situation, Iraq, Ukraine. I think it is a tipping point when we have a crisis. How do we end up to get to that point? It's not like the hiss of Titanic. It just doesn't happen. It takes time. It's a sequence of events. And the question for us as a community is, can we find what those events are? Can we stop the events? It's small, it's repeated incidents. It's the interaction of humans with the, with the climate humans with the machines, humans with technology? Do we understand what happens when those interactions take place? And where is the cause? We as humans believe in cause and effect. David Hume says that everything that has an effect has a cause. And how do we learn what cause and effect is? You watch a ball, you're playing pool, the ball hits another ball, the second ball moves. We learn within our environment what the effect is. The fact is that is very subjective because of what we experience with the temperature, with the gravity. If you've studied physics, it is very subjective to the situation that you see. So we determine what the effect is with our very limited knowledge and understanding. Vice and virtue like color, sound, and heat. They're not qualities, but perceptions of our mind. And based on the perceptions of our mind, we determine what will happen. And that's when the uncertainty principle comes in. And that's when we get crisis. So how do we understand, how do we determine, how do we innovate better 
so we can stop the ironic and unintended consequences. So I want to talk about innovation a little bit because that's my field. And the fact is innovative people are pain in the neck. Nobody wants innovative people. No country wants them. No, no corporation wants them. No government wants them. Because they come up with their harebrained ideas. And they change things. But we doubt it. We can't survive. The question is, how do we manage innovation? Look at some of the advancements in technology. Amazing advancements. The power of technology is immense. What we can do to improve human life. Look at the, in, in East Africa, even in Europe for a long time, the livestock using mobile phones to send early warnings on drought in East Africa. The, uh, within Europe, the European farmers are tracking their, um, their livestock with smart chips and smart cards. And in the city of New York, we still don't have smart cards. There's huge advancements in food with genetic engineering. We could address and we could hugely impact the issues of famine if we truly use technology and innovation to be able to ensure that the crop actually survives in bad environments. Again, if you look at genetic splicing, kissing bug is a bug that impacts millions of people and livestock. With the ability to make the bug sterile through genetic splicing, we can address a disease which is a serious concern in Latin America and in Africa. Creation of organs using organic semiconductors, what it can do in terms of disease and health. These are amazing innovations. You look at the smart dustbins where you can track climate issues, environmental issues, troop movements. So 20th century, when we look back, um, a lot of things happened. We had two world wars. We had a cold war. We sent a man to the moon. We, we came up with antibiotics. But what was the most important thing about the 20th century? It was the internet. It was technology. We created the species called technology. We got connected. The world got connected. When the airplanes and the air travel, travel started, people said that it would stop the wars because people are going to see each other and they're not going to fight anymore. Well, that didn't happen. They said the same thing about the internet, that the internet would bring freedom and would, would reduce the war, but that hasn't happened either. The fact is in many countries, if you, if you have a, a connection to the internet or if you have a fax, that is a big crime. Freedom of press is owning the press in much of the, in much of the um, developing markets. 15 years in jail for owning a fax in Burma. The fact is that because of the innovation, because of the advancements in communications technology, we have seen movements in Africa and in Middle East, in Latin America, because of access to innovation. In a crackdown by uh, Minimer's junta on its monks, what actually got the information out was the blogging. The information got out. Nothing is hidden. If you look at Arab Spring, a great deal of what's happened is visibility to the rest of the world and visibility to what's happening in Middle East. You're all familiar with Haiti. Many of you were engaged, very involved. A lot of UN responded very quickly. The humanitarian organization responded very quickly. And they used technology to do mapping, find out where people are. They used the social media. The impact was horrendous. But relief workers used technology for crowdsourcing. GPS technology, which is huge in terms of understanding where the people are, how to put them into um, the, the, golf, the um, center that they, they brought most of the people who were impacted. But sometimes things do go wrong, 
going to come stand closer to you because I'm having a problem here. Sometimes things do go wrong. If you look at child trafficking, 80% of it is done online. What are we doing about that? We innovated. We created the Internet. But did we think that creation of the Internet is going to create an explosion in child trafficking? And how do we respond to that? That is a crisis that has been created. It's the side effect. It's the revenge of an innovation. Cybercrime. We are looking at the wars of the future. As UN, with peacekeepers, people with a blue helmet and, and hard hats and boots on the ground, how do we prevent the cybercrime? How do we pre prevent when one country attacks another country, brings the electric grid down, and then the hospitals go down? attack the transportation system, the water system, and they all go down. What is the humanitarian impact of a cyber crime, cyber intrusion? And how do we prepare for it? Who is going to prevent it? Who is going to um, make sure that we strengthen the, the industrial systems of these countries? Who is going to monitor? There's a concept about watering hole you all know about. I mean, in, in terms of cyber security for even companies and governments and NGOs, not only the countries. This has become a huge issue in terms of privacy. So how do we respond to that as, as an organization, as a technology sector? Have or have not, the digital divide is becoming wider and wider. What is our solution to that? How do we respond to that crisis? The, um, the homo sapiens are becoming homo mobilis. I came in earlier here, and everybody was on their computers and on their iPhones. What is it doing to us socially? How will we change as societies 5, 10, 50 years from now? Will that be a crisis that we have to deal with? The relationship between us and a person at a bus stop has almost disappeared. The relationship, the, the tighter relationships getting tighter, but the looser bonds are getting looser. So how do, we, how do we behave as a society as we go forward? And what is the crisis? Do we understand? Do we have the sophistication to understand? You look at the mobile devices, 80% of cars, actually, I would say that's much higher, 90% of phone calls originate inside a car. 80% of accidents are because of mobile devices. Did we know when we innovated that the impact of innovation would be accidents. Madrid bombing, 191 people died. The bomb was detonated using a mobile device, using a cell phone. Again, what are we doing about that? If you look at the biggest invention of the 20th century, single combustion engine, did we know when we created the car that we're going to have the environmental issues that we're confronted today? The impact on suburbanization, the impact on water, the impact on land, the impact on humans, the changes in a society, one innovation, simple innovation of single combustion engine. If you look at our carbon footprints, in, within the US, within the Western world, we, we have four times the carbon footprint than everybody else in the world. For us to survive, we have to drop that drastically. What are we doing about it? Our failure to address the climate change is a big crisis. Look at the deforestation. There's a serious issue with deforestation. We understand, we have some analytical data about it, but what do we do about that? Is that all, all the social issues of the world are left to the NGOs, to the UN, to the governments to deal with. The private sector creates $30 trillion per year. The governments, three. The issues of poverty, disease, child trafficking, drug trafficking, environment. All of these are left on the hands of the three trillion. How do we respond? Because these social issues have huge impact in the private sector. When Ebola breaks out and the economy of West Africa declines, it has a huge impact in the private sector. These are not only social issues that impact the governments. So how do we come together? If you look at Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, the typhoon in Philippines, 
We're not prepared. Look at e-waste. I was in China a couple of years ago, and I went to a town called Guayu, and this is what I saw. Impact of mercury, lead. You burn the electronics, you get dioxin. We, this, is, this is the equation. And I, as a CIO for 30 years, have contributed to the creation of that. What is my plan to address the e-waste? We have no plans. We just create it. The impact of mercury in water, in land, not only in the landfills in China, we ship them to China and India. Some go to Latin America, but we also ship them right here to New Jersey. Why can't we stop putting poisonous materials into the electronics? When can we start to clean up the, the poisonous materials that has seeped into the water and into the land? If you look at mercury, mercury is, um, is a mineral. So as a pregnant woman is exposed to it, or actually when a woman is exposed to it, it stays within their body till they're pregnant, and the body mistakes it for calcium and gives it to the child. So this is not something that happens because the time you're exposed to it. It could take years. Dioxin, if you go to India, you see a lot of people burning electronics. Dioxin is like Agent Orange. The impact of it, the life expectancy of the people you see is probably 30, 35 years. How do we address that crisis? How do we move to say, you can't dump this stuff in my background, but it's okay to do it somewhere else without the hazmat materials? It's a no unless policy. How do we come together to get the unless out of it? It is a global world. And as we, as we innovate, as we put strict policies around protection of people, we need to look at where the unless fits. So what keeps me awake at night is that the way we use the planet is just unsustainable. We have social issues, we have environmental issues, economical issues, and we have the responsibility to address them. As government, as private sector, as NGOs, how do we respond to those? I wonder and I believe that science and technology can improve the environment. Can we innovate? How can we innovate together? Can it end hunger? Advancements in science, in technology, in genetic splicing should end hunger if we work together. 1.2 billion people live with less than a dollar a day. Is that acceptable? The inequity of, sell of income is not acceptable. It ra raises serious issues of, of disease, of hunger, of conflict. Less than 6% of the world population has 45% of the wealth. How do we close the gap? 50,000 people die each day from poverty. And the poorest 20% receive only 1.4% of the total world income. Unless we address the income issue, we can't proceed. So how do we, I mean, these are the crises of this world that we confront every day. Can science and technology reduce hunger? I want to talk about risk a little bit. We as technology people look at risk in terms of the visible, visible risks. We as CIOs look at our technology, disaster recovery, make sure our servers are backed up, but we don't look at invisible risk. The invisible risk. I go back to the hiss of Titanic. It takes a long time for it to happen. It is like that innovation, the invention of a single combustion engine that 30, 40 years later, it creates a climate crisis. And within the tech world, we have a paradox because we focus on the, the tools, the hardware, the software. We don't realize and we don't see and foresee the experience of it. To me, technology is a thing and a flow. It's the heart when it's off and experience of it on the world. And when technology begins to interact within the world, the, the outcome of it, the experience of it is very different than what we expect it to be. So how do we predict? How do we understand? How do we innovate responsibly? 
Francis Bacon said the aim of science was for a man's uh, pursuit for ultimate salvation when he had taken from the fall. So is that what it is? But can we innovate responsibly? The fact is you can't, you can't restrict innovation. It needs to have the freedom. Because if you restrict innovation, it wouldn't be what we need it to be. But it does have broad implications. And, and do we as technologists have the sophistication to understand the broad implications long term? So we would not have a crisis. Because if we don't look, uh, we don't stop and look at innovation in every aspect, then we will have crisis that we can't deal with in 10, 20, 30 years from now. Can we find a better way to work together to solve the world problems? I believe we can. I believe this group is an example of working together. It's about partnership. It's about looking at humanitarian issues from a very large perspective and try to see how we can bring policy, how can we bring investments of the private sector to resolve them. For three decades, we've, we've moved from the famous quote of Margaret Thatcher that there is no alternative to say that, yes, another world is possible. But can we not hesitate to ask the next question? Will we? I'll stop there. Thank you very much.